Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Eldon Taylor. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. The next hour is devoted to learning something more, not just about the world of shoes and ships and sealing wax, but about how, what, and why we believe as we do. A time for the open-minded, willing to challenge some of those old ideas behind what we think we know, who we are, and who we might just become. I'm Eldon Taylor, and this is Provocative Enlightenment. All right, our chat room is open, and my partner, Ravinder, awaits you there now with bated breath. You can log on by going to provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. Ravinder, tell us all about the chat room and why any listener would want to come and participate. Because we have a fabulous chat room, and I'm always waiting to see who's going to come in today. We get our regular people, and then we get those people that just uh, come in occasionally. And then I hear from lots of people that they come and watch, but they don't actually speak up. So do at least come in and say hello. Um, but yeah, I always learn something from the other people in the group. Um, it's just a really fun group to hang out with, and then, you know, sh- share our ideas about whatever you're discussing on the air so do come join us that is provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat all right in this week's spotlight i wish to draw attention to the notion of gratitude for years i have taught what has become referred to as the four corner philosophy for self-fulfillment those four corners include forgiveness gratitude self-responsibility and service but again today i wish to focus on gratitude specifically What is the purpose of having a gratitude attitude? Gratitude is something that typically is the topic of pastors and counselors. However, there is a growing body of science that is beginning to show the many benefits available as a result of a gratitude attitude. Gratitude is an emotion that reduces anxiety and ameliorates stress. Gratitude can enable the optimal operation of your endocrine and immune system. Studies have shown that grateful people are less materialistic and therefore less disturbed by what is called keeping up with the Joneses. There is less enmity and envy in the life of a grateful person when compared to a similar when compared to similar people who do not practice gratitude as a part of their lives. Gratitude can be as simple as counting blessings instead of burdens, and this leads to a stronger subjective sense of well being. Gratitude has also been shown to have a positive correlation with wellness, to say nothing of improving in everything from relationship to finances. The simple truth is that from a purely pragmatic perspective, a gratitude attitude leads to a happier life. That said, there are some moral implications derived from gratitude as well, as most religious and spiritual leaders suggest. I mean, in a broader sense, is it immoral to be ungrateful? Now, admittedly, gratitude is often used as a moral motive to encourage pro-social behavior. For example, failing to recognize or appreciate a gift is deemed more than just unacceptably rude. It's often also viewed as immoral. Studies have shown that people are much more likely to express gratitude when their feelings are public. So gratitude takes on all sorts of social implications. Does that mean that it's ethical for a culture to expect gratitude in order for one to maintain a social standing in society? We're all enculturated in ways that demand reciprocity in one way or another. I suppose the question of the ethical merits to any system that so imposes rights and duties on each of us that have nothing to do with lawfulness is another subject. For now, the benefits to both the individual and society at large have been shown to demonstrate that purely practical side inherent in cultivating gratitude. As such, I choose to be a bit of a Pollyanna, I suppose. To that end, I begin each day with a thank you, thank you, thank you, and then I smile. A big, good old-fashioned smile. 
ear to ear if I can draw it, because I know that my brain doesn't know the difference between faking a smile and a real smile. No, the brain simply responds to the facial expressions and releases hormones, the body's own natural opiates, and guess what? I suddenly feel better right away. In my mind, that's the real meaning of the phrase, fake it till you make it. Those are my thoughts. What are yours, Ravinder? I do like the fake it till you make it. I have to admit, you know, I do quite, quite a bit of that. Um, when oh. <laughs> I knew you were going to go down there. I knew it. That's why I was hesitating saying anything. Um, no, I was talking more about putting on a positive attitude. I know a couple of days ago I got up in the morning and I didn't want to wake up. My body didn't want to wake up. I was really, really dragging. And I would tell myself, no, I'm fine, I'm good. And I would put my shoulders back and, you know, tell myself I felt good. And within half an hour, I felt I, I was feeling good. Whereas if I had allowed myself to, oh, my God, I don't want to get up. My body hurts sometimes. You know, it would have drug on a whole lot longer. So the fake it till you make it. Um, you know, there are lots of people that put that attitude down because they say that it's not real, it's not authentic. But I can tell you from personal experience, I use that kind of attitude in so many different places and it helps me get through so much and makes my whole life a whole lot brighter. Well, the alternative is certainly not uh, pleasant. So, from, again, from a pragmatic standpoint, but now you said... You were mostly or largely. What is that percentage that you were talking about? Don't be cheeky. Everybody knows. <laughs> okay. Every week I read some of your letters as our way of involving you while paying respect to the very important role you play in making this show successful. Last week our show uh, featured Professor Daniel Shapiro, and we discussed his book, Negotiating the Non-Negotiable. Alan wrote, what a great show with Dr. Shapiro. I got quite a bit out of it, and his explanation of what is going on in Washington sure clarified a lot for me. Brian wrote, great information in the interview, deep conversation in the chat room. Yeah, you had a deep conversation in the chat room, huh? It was very deep, yes. Jonathan wrote, hi, Eldon. I want to thank you for your longtime service. Your subliminal tapes, CDs, and now MP3s have been a key part of my personal wellness approach for over 25 years. Just feeling the urge to send along my appreciation, as I know this element has played a key role in my current mindset and circumstances. Many, many thanks. Well, thank you, Jonathan, for the feedback. All right, I'm going to cut letters short today. Uh, we have a guest that I really want to get to. Uh, but I do want to thank all of you for your letters. Uh, and I invite you to opine by emailing me at Eldon, that's E-L-D-O-N, at EldonTaylor.com, or by joining me on Facebook, where you can make all the comments you want. We sincerely appreciate your feedback and support. Now to this week's show, Ethics in the Real World with Professor Peter Singer. So let me tell you a little about today's guest. Peter Singer has been described as the world's most influential living philosopher. His book, Animal Liberation, is credited with having triggered the animal rights movement, while his work on global poverty has played an important role in promoting effective altruism, which encourages more effective giving to help people in extreme poverty. He is the founder of The Life You Can Save, an organization that encourages effective giving. He is professor of bioethics at Princeton University and now spends part of each year at the University of Melbourne in Australia, where he is laureate professor. His most recent book, a collection of short popular essays, is the subject of today's show, Ethics in the Real World. And it's an important subject as well as being a great read. So on that, let's get him in here. Welcome to Provocative Enlightenment, Professor Peter Singer. Thank you. I'm very happy to be with you. Ah, uh, it's indeed our pleasure. I've been very much looking forward to this for many, many reasons, including the fact that my my wife is personally inspired by your work and has become a vegan, and and her crusade on animal rights uh, shames me, and I thought I was an animal crusader. But you heard right, today's... Okay, well, women do often shame us, don't they? They seem to be more ethical than we are often. 
Well, you know, while you're on that subject, I still have my two kidneys. Uh, but I do donate, <laughs> okay? I have to, you know, your TED Talk, of course, is is a marvelous yeah, yeah, sure, piece. No, 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 we'll get no. to that kind of thing in a bit. But you heard today's spotlight, Professor. Societies expect behaviors that vary from culture to culture. Some of these trained behaviors, if you will, require responses that another culture can find literally abhorrent. It may be necessary, but is it really ethical to make demands like this on folks often before they're even able to reason about it? Uh, Well, I certainly think that we need to talk about ethics with people when they're quite young and encourage them to act ethically. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by before they're even able to reason about it. Are you talking about young children? Uh, Well, um, let's go this way. Let me ask you just very directly. Um, Is there an ethical basis to cultural relativity? I mean, practices in some culture appear to be absolutely immoral in other cultures. Honor killings is a case in point. Absolutely. I I think they are objectively wrong. Um, I don't think, uh, I'm not a cultural relativist. I don't think we have to respect every culture. Uh, Cultures change. Our culture has changed a lot over uh, recent decades and centuries. And uh, some of those changes are in the right direction. I think that uh, we should feel free to criticize other cultures. Obviously, uh, do so in a a sensitive way. Um, We're not going to get anywhere in any case if we're not sensitive, but uh, but when you talk about things like uh, honor killings or genital mutilation, um, I think it's clear that, that these are practices that should not exist. Um, uh, as with practices in our society that we used to have, we're only too familiar with uh, the fact that the say, parts of the United States accepted slavery, so um, we, we think that was wrong. We're not uh, cultural relativists about that. So I don't think we need to be about every other culture either. So, you know, one of the issues that we hear so much anymore from everybody is I have my personal truth. It's my personal truth. Um, And and I have caught some of your debates uh, with theists. Um, Well, one in particular. Uh, And you write about it in your book. Um, Do you subscribe to the idea that there is uh, an ultimate right, uh, an ultimate wrong? I think that there is, yes. Um, and now, maybe not on, you know, everything it's hard to say exactly what is and isn't on some some questions. But, for instance, if someone says, uh, it's fine for me to cause agony to many people because I enjoy watching them suffer, uh, I think that's objectively wrong. Um, I don't think there's any two ways about that. I don't think you can say, well, you know, that's something that's your opinion and someone else might have a different opinion. Uh, I think that if we put ourselves in the position of those suffering, we can see that we would not regard that as acceptable just because somebody else enjoyed watching us suffer. And I think ethics requires us to put ourselves in the position of others. And that helps us to get to answers. So let me see. I want to make sure that I understand you. So if the argument comes forward that, well, my God or my religious teachings, my belief, my holy book um, gives me the right to behave this way or instructs me to behave this way. And the way we're behaving for all intent and purposes injures uh, another life form uh, intentionally, uh, maybe even in malevolent ways, but maybe... Um, in less than malevolent, it's just considered to be the practice of the culture. Is that ethically wrong to you in, in your mind? Well, the example I gave was just a little stronger than that, right? You said injures somebody. Um, I said causes agony just for the sheer fun of it. Um, uh, so I used a fairly strong example. Uh, there may be some cases where we justify it in inflicting some harms on some beings in order to prevent greater harms occurring to others or in order to produce some important good. Uh, but certainly I don't think the fact that uh, someone, someone claims that they have a holy book that justifies this um, makes it right or means that we should accept it. Uh, I think you know, what we have there is actually perhaps a factual difference rather than an ethical difference. That is, uh, is there in fact um, 
such a holy book is it doesn't have the authority of having been inspired by some divine being. Uh, so there are factual questions about whether there is any kind of God, uh, and also, even if one were to concede that, whether any particular scripture is an authentic account of the will of that God. Um, those are those are relevant questions that you would want to ask in, in that particular case. True. Uh, obviously, I guess where I'm going is there's quite a difference between uh, punishing a capital crime, and I'm going to ask you what your thoughts are on capital punishment, and um, say the punishment meted out by a disappointed husband uh, who lives in Pakistan, who bought a wife who was 14 years old, but she failed to please him, so he cuts her, her, her nose off and puts her out in the barn. Um, there's quite a difference in those two behaviors, is there not? There is, definitely. So, so, so I understand you would find the latter, the, the husband in Pakistan, you would find that unethical. What do you find with regard to capital punishment in our own culture? So I, I think that the problem with, with capital punishment in our own culture is that there is no evidence that it's uh, a uniquely effective deterrent. Um, and I don't think that any of the other justifications for it are really good ones. Um, I don't. I would not rule it out in principle if somebody could prove to me that for every uh, murderer that you executed, you would prevent two other murders being committed. Um, I would accept capital punishment because I think that what you want to do is to reduce the incidence of murder. You don't want innocent people being killed. And if the only way to reduce that where to execute people who after careful examination and trials and appeals uh, had been shown beyond reasonable doubt to be guilty of murder uh, I would not I would not be opposed to that but uh, the fact is that there is no such evidence in fact the evidence is pretty clear it goes the other way that um, there is nothing particularly effective about capital punishment as a deterrent that's that's very in fact it's it's not as cost effective as just um, imprisoning him for life. Uh, but what you did is you you showed me that within your ethical system there is a a point of compromise or a possibility of a, a moving target here, and it would depend. It and it takes on a bit of a relative perspective then, as opposed to an absolute. Did I interpret that correctly? That's not the language, that's not the terminology that I would use. Um, I still think there is an objective truth about whether in any particular circumstances capital punishment is justified. Uh, that truth will depend on the facts of the situation, but that doesn't make it relative. Um, that just means that my the ethic that I'm using depends on the consequences of your actions. I think any rational ethic has to take some account of the consequences of what you're doing. And uh, those consequences will vary in different circumstances. So that, uh, you know, as I say, if, if uh, capital punishment were a unique deterrent, that would change the circumstances in a relevant way. But, but the underlying ethical principle would still be the same. That is, uh, say, if you could save two innocent lives by executing one uh, condemned murderer, that would be the right thing to do. And that's a hypothetical claim. It says if that were the case. So it's, it's, not, it's relative in, in the sense of being sensitive to the facts that are, that are relevant to that. But it's not uh, relative in the sense that, well, you can't say whether it's true or false. I, I think it is an objectively true claim. I got you. Thank you for clarifying that. Uh, all right. We recently had Ingrid Newkirk on our show. I know you know who she is. Uh, I know Ingrid, she had, yes. Yeah, she informed us that it was your book, Animal Liberation, that inspired the foundation of PETA. Uh, she spoke about how far we had come uh, since back in the 90s with animal rights, specifically with chicken farming methods. Given what you know today, have we really become any more humane in our farming methods? And is it even possible, in your opinion? Yes, I, I agree with Ingrid. I think we have made progress. Um we still need to make a lot more progress, but compared with where we were um, in the 1990s, or certainly going back even further to 1975 when I wrote Animal Liberation, 
uh, we've made significant progress. Let me just put it that way. I would have liked to see more. But uh, I, I wasn't listening to Ingrid, but perhaps she was mentioning that, um, for example, in the state of California, uh, where you are, it's no longer legal to keep hens in small wire cages so that they can't even stretch their wings without touching the side of the cage. Um, similarly, you have to allow pigs and calves room to turn around without um, being hampered by the size of their cage or by crowding against other animals. Uh, and that was passed in, uh, as you probably know, in 2008, and your listeners probably know, in a, uh, in, in a referendum that uh, gave a very substantial majority to it. Uh, and just recently, at the last uh, elections in November, the state of Massachusetts passed similar legislation, I think, if I remember rightly, with a 77% majority, one of the largest uh, initiatives ever to be passed, largest margin. So I think those are, are good signs that we are making progress. Um, obviously, I'd like that to happen across the entire country and ac across the entire world, for that matter. But um, uh, similar things have been happening in Europe, you know, across the European Union. These methods of uh, confining animals have also been prohibited uh, over the last uh, couple of decades. So, yeah, this is important progress. This, this gives somewhat better lives to hundreds of millions of animals, um, and that, that matters. Um, but, of course, there are still not just hundreds of millions, but, in fact, billions of animals on factory farms that have miserable lives. And that's why this is nowhere near enough progress. Okay. In juxtaposition to that, I think one of the material breaches, in my view, to those interested in farming methods comes about as a result of the many new laws in multiple states that now make it illegal to film uh, activities in slaughter yards and in some farming uh, instances. Um, it, it's as though that industry wants to hide from the public what really goes on, and our legal system is willing to punish people who might film and thereby share honestly the real truth. Do you see this as a natural backlash from the farming community? How do you feel about that activity? No, I don't think these ag-gag laws are a natural backlash. I think they're actually a very serious mistake that the farming community or some parts of the farming community are making to try to prevent uh, the public learning how their food is produced. Uh, and I don't think that could possibly be a good sales pitch. I mean, if you're saying to the public, you know, we want to sell you food, but you're not allowed to see how we produce it, that clearly opens the factory farming industry to suspicion. So I think it's a tactical bad move on their part. Um, it shows that they're frightened, but if the public does find out how they treat animals, the public will stop buying their products. And you know, actually, given, given how they do treat animals, they're right to be frightened about that. Um, but I don't think it's going to work. Um, I don't think it's going to work, well, partly for the reason I just mentioned. It's very bad public relations. But also, um, you know, none of these laws have actually got up to the Supreme Court yet. Um, so I'm skeptical that our legal system does allow such restrictions. Uh, they have been passed in states where there's a lot of agriculture and where the legislatures are heavily influenced by the farming or lobby, or should, I should say by the agribusiness lobby, because it's not really small traditional farmers who want this. Um, but, uh, you know, so far um, they haven't really been challenged all the way up, and I'm really hopeful that if they are, they'll be found to be unconstitutional. Yeah, I'm not familiar with any case that has been forwarded at all to an appellate court, uh, let alone the Supreme Court. Are you aware of anything? No, certainly nothing has gone up to, uh, I think, either the appeals court or the uh, federal uh, court, courts of appeals, the appeals circuit. Um, I think they've still been at fairly low level. There haven't actually been many prosecutions. That's one of the things. You know, There's been a lot of publicity and attention to these laws, but uh, there have only been a handful of prosecutions, to my knowledge, and uh, they haven't got really out of the state court systems as yet. Yeah. Well, as far as I'm concerned, I think it's obscene that uh, that you know government allows, let alone creates, uh, laws that uh, limit us from understanding or knowing or visually recording and thereby sharing what goes on in these slaughter yards. Uh, but that's it. Yeah, We've got a hard break coming up. 
when uh, when I come when we come back, I want to ask you about morality and ethics. I think there's some confusion. I, I'm going to ask you to differentiate if there is a differentiation. We're speaking with Professor Peter Singer about his book Ethics in the Real World. It's a great read. I think it's an important read, and it's definitely an important issue of our time. You can learn more about our guest by visiting his website, petersinger.info. Now, we have a video for you in our chat room featuring uh, Professor uh, Singer exploring morality and selfishness in more modern times. So if you're not in the chat room already, now's the time to get over there. Okay, do stay tuned. We'll be right back. You're listening to Provocative Enlightenment with Elton Taylor. Change has never been easier. Whether you wish to lose weight, stop smoking, build better relationships, become creative, enjoy ultra prosperity, or simply relax and promote self-healing, InnerTalk has been repeatedly demonstrated effective in the most rigorous of scientific studies. Our customers love InnerTalk. Sean wrote, I have struggled with bulimia for over 30 years and have never been able to lose weight without restoring to it until I used Inner Talk. Vicki wrote, My hubby has been using the Stop Snoring CD and already his dangerous and raucous snoring levels have stopped. Celeste wrote, I recently graduated from Taft Law School with honors. I'm writing to tell you how much your Inner Talk CD, Excel in Exams, has helped me. With over 300 titles to choose from, there is something for everyone. Check it out today by going to innertalk.com. Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Elvin Taylor. Welcome back. If you've just joined us, we're chatting with Professor Peter Singer about his book, Ethics in the Real World. You can learn more about our guest by visiting his website, petersinger.info. Now, we ask our guests for their favorite music. As you know, music has uh, some true significance uh, in many ways, and music psychology is a field of research and a new hobby of mine with practical relevance across many domains, including intelligence, creativity, personality, and social behavior. All right, we just played some of John Lennon performing Imagine. So please tell us, Professor, why is this music important to you, and how does it instruct us about who you are? Well, I suppose it tells people something about my age and the era in which I grew up. That is, the the Beatles were really important when I was uh, in my teens and uh, late teens and so on. So I listened to the Beatles a lot. They were a liberating breakthrough in terms of the music that was had been around beforehand. Uh, so that's certainly a part of it. But that specific song, um, I think, does say something about my views about religion. Uh, imagine there's re- no religion, nothing to fight or die for. Um I wouldn't deny that religion has some positive aspect to it, that uh, it can encourage people to be charitable, to be kind, to love each other. But unfortunately, very often it does lead in the other way. It leads people to to hate, to divide, uh, and even to kill. And of course, we've seen some highly publicized and very tragic cases of that uh, in the world in the last uh, decade or so. So... um, I think, in a way, yeah, we would we would be better off without religion if we could harness the positive aspects of human nature without the negative division, divisiveness of religion, and and I would say without some of the false beliefs that religion preserves and that influences the way we act. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate what you just said, and you know, I have to. I'm going to ask you something, and I find in in a era where we are so sensitive about, um, you know, human rights, and and particularly the notion of segregation, that the ultimate segregation takes place within religion. 
um, if I belong to a religion, well, then I have the only truth, and that means that I'm preferred in a sense to you. So we really create classes. We really do some serious, I think, segregation on, in the name of religion, even if we even if we say, oh, but we're kind of inclusive, I mean, we accept so-and-so, even though they don't have the true religion, we're still nevertheless treating them in a disdainful fashion. Uh, your thoughts on that, sir? Yeah, I think that can very often happen. I think actually in the United States, people have been quite good at overcoming that. Uh, that is that there are many religions that would say, well, you, know, you have your religion and I have mine and I'll respect your religion. Um, but but when you think of it, religions do make claims to truth and uh, it's sometimes even puzzling that people are so tolerant of other religions if they really were to seriously believe that everything that their religion says is true. Um, so they do have that tendency to divide. And, of course, uh, when you get to other countries, things are very, very much worse. And to be a member of a, of a minority religion can be to be persecuted and even to be killed. Uh, we've seen uh, horrific examples of that, of course, with, uh, with Islamic State. And the fact that people who are not, not even not Muslims, but people who are members of the wrong kind of Muslims, if they were Shiites, for example, um, were liable to be killed just, just for that. So it is quite horrific how religion can lead people to think that uh, everybody who doesn't believe their religion is uh, what ought to be killed or persecuted in some way. I think it was Bertrand Russell who said mankind has killed more of its fellow uh, humans, uh, humankind in the name of religion and in all other causes combined. Uh, let's do this. Let's go to your... I, I told you that before the break, I was going to ask you about the difference between morality and ethics. And then during the break, uh, Ravinder posed a question that I think drives right to that point. You indicated in our conversation about capital punishment that if you had data that showed um, without a doubt that it was an effective deterrent that you you would probably come down in favor of capital punishment. Don't let me put words in your mouth. And so the question is, let's assume that you had that data, and it was hard data. Would it be moral, even though, according to how I understood you, it would be ethical, would it still be moral to go ahead and put that person to death? Yes, I, th I think it would. Um... I mean, the distinction between those two terms is getting a little slippery, really. I think there used to be a time in which we talked about morals in the sense of what is the public morality, what is what are the morals that people follow, more or less looking at society as, a, as an anthropologist or a sociologist. You could say, well, that's the morals of Americans or Samoans or whoever else it might be. Um, and we kept ethics for something that was more codified, perhaps like we talked about medical ethics or legal ethics. But um, I think in the last few decades, people have stopped using morals and morality in that distinctive way, and perhaps because they felt that those were very loaded terms um, and they didn't want to feel so heavy when they were talking about things, they started using ethics to mean essentially the same, that is, standards of what we ought to do. And so when I, those remarks I made about capital punishment, which you summarized correctly, um, I, would, I would say that, it, yes, it would be both morally right and ethical to execute uh, convicted murderers if, firstly, the trial process was sufficiently sound that you could rely on, on the, only those who really were guilty being convicted. And secondly, as you said, if you really had hard data that showed this was the best and most effective way of reducing the number of murders. Um, now, of course, neither of those factual hypotheses are actually true in the United States on the basis of the evidence we have, so that's why I'm opposed to capital punishment. But, but I, I would think if those facts were there, that would make the, right, make the difference and make it both moral and ethical to do it. All right. You 
are a rather controversial figure, understandably so. And part of that controversy arises as a result of your approach to inf- uh, inf- inf- <laughs> infanticide. I'll get the word out in abortion. Flesh out for us what your perspective, what your views are there. Sure. Let me start um, by reminding you and your listeners about decisions that are already being taken and that essentially you know, nobody or very few people really challenge in uh, intensive care units for newborn infants in essentially every, every city, in every major city in the United States and uh, here where I am now in Australia and in uh, Europe and, and pretty much everywhere in the world. And that is, uh, if infants are born with uh, conditions that mean that they don't have any real prognosis for a meaningful life, for example, they've got very severe brain damage and they're never going to be able even to recognize their mother and smile at their mother or something along those lines. Um, and if they need life support, so let's say they're very premature um, and they need to be on a respirator in order to breathe and they'll need to be on that respirator, let's say, for the next month, um, doctors will talk to parents about whether they want the child to continue to be on the respirator. And if the parents, after realizing how limited the life of their child is going to be, say, no, we think it's better to turn off the respirator, then that's what the doctors do. Um, And the child dies because the child can't breathe without the respirator. And everybody knows that the child is going to die. So we are already making decisions which cause the death of infants on the basis of, firstly, a very poor prognosis for the future of that child, And secondly, the wishes uh, of the parents after they've thought about this issue perhaps been cancelled and informed about the nature of the condition. And as I said, everybody thinks that's the right, and so do I. Um, But what might happen is that the child might have exactly the same prognosis and the parents might have the same views about the child's life not really being one that's worth living. But the child perhaps is not so premature and does not need to be on a respirator. So the child can breathe on on, on its own. And in those circumstances, everything changes. Doctors won't ask the parents what they want to do about the child because there is no medical treatment that they can withdraw that would cause the death of the child. Now, my view is that the really important ethical question is, is the child's life of sufficient quality so that it's good that that child should live? And do the parents want that child to live? Will they, are they prepared to commit to loving and caring for that child? Um, whether the child can or cannot breathe on its own seems to me to be not really an important moral question. Uh, so put it another way, whether you bring about the child's death by turning off the respirator, as already happens now, or you bring about the child's death by giving the child a drug that causes the child to die, uh, I don't think that that's a a crucial moral difference. In in both cases, you know what you're doing. You're deliberately ending the life of the child, and and you you don't have to do that. You could keep the respirator going. You could not give the child the drug. It's a decision you make, and you ought to be responsible for it. So when I talk about infanticide, I'm, I'm really saying I think that it ought to be permissible to end the life of a child with a very poor prognosis when the parents don't want that child to live, think it's better that the child should not live, by administering a drug to that child, just as it is currently permissible to do it by turning off the respirator. Abortion. Yeah, so um, I think that uh, what is what, what we need to think about in the case of abortion is not the question of does abortion end the human life, uh, where I think the opponents of abortion are on strong ground. I think that the fetus is clearly alive, the embryo is alive, um, and it is a human being, not a member of any other species. But rather, um, what are the characteristics that make it wrong to end the human life? So I don't accept the assumption that it's always wrong to end the human life. And I've just indicated that uh, we, we do that in intensive care units with babies anyway or by withdrawing treatment, which is ending life. 
In the case of abortion, I think the fetus is not... Uh, well, certainly, if the abortion takes place before, let's say, 20 weeks of the pregnancy, which almost all abortions do, then abortion is not uh, killing a being that is even conscious yet. And I think that um, consciousness is a necessary element of being having interests of having, uh, if you like, a right to life. Uh, in fact, I might even go further and say that mere consciousness is not enough, but some kind of self-awareness might be required. But, um, but in any case, I think that uh, the life of the fetus has... It is a human life, uh, I don't deny that, but um, I don't think you get to have a right to life just by being a member of the species Homo sapiens. I think it, it takes more. And the fetus, and certainly the early fetus, does not yet have that more that I think is required. So in those circumstances, if a woman decides she doesn't wish to be pregnant, uh, I think that should be her choice. So self-awareness is the criteria that you apply then. If, we, if well, there's a reason there to believe that the... Pardon? Sorry. Uh, when, when there is self-awareness, then... Um, you know, there is something more that uh, needs to be taken into account. And uh, yes, in general, I would say uh, when you get to that point, your life ought to be protected. Um, but uh, Don't you have to there, start there fractionating things, but... what you mean by self-awareness? Or, or are you going to spread the same rights clear across the world uh, in, in every living entity that we encounter? Because it would seem to me that there is a self-awareness in a lizard. I'm not sure about a lizard, but certainly if you'd said a chimpanzee, I would have totally agreed. And uh, I think many people who live with dogs would think that there is self-awareness in dogs, too. Um, so, yes, there is certainly there are a lot of non-human animals who are self-aware. Because, and if dogs are, then I think it's reasonable to suggest that pigs are. They can seem to be at least as intelligent as dogs. Uh, so, yes, I, I do uh, take that view. I think that uh, as I said, uh, the, the species that you're a member of um, is not morally crucial. What what is thought to be important is the characteristics that you have, um, the kind of being that you are. But uh, to say, well, because you're a member of the species Homo sapiens, you can't. But if you're a member of the species Pantroglodytes, that's the chimpanzees, um, then you don't can't because you know you're not one of our species. But too close to the racist who said, well, if you're European descent, you can't, and if you're of African descent, you don't can't. Um, these are not in themselves relevant, ethically relevant ways of, of carving up the, the beings in the world. Uh, we ought to be looking at what kind of beings they are and giving them rights or moral status on the basis of what kinds of beings they are rather than on what species they belong to. Okay, well, you teased it out. I was going to ask you anyway, but all right. <clears throat> Does a chimpanzee have any greater or lesser right to protection under the law than a human embryo? Yeah, I think that there are, you know, a, 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 a chimpanzee uh, is conscious, is, as we were just saying, to some extent self conscious, um, can feel things, has a rich emotional life. You only have to read books by Jane Goodall, for example, to see that. Um, they have a conception of, of themselves and the world and their relations with other members of their group. Uh, they grieve if somebody close to them dies. Uh, they plan ahead for the future in various ways. Uh, an embryo can do none of these things. So uh, I do think if it comes to a choice between uh, protecting a chimpanzee from harm um, and protecting an embryo from harm, then considering them in themselves, uh, the chimpanzee should be the one that is more worthy of protection. Um, of course, if the parents care about the embryo, if this is a child they're looking forward to having, perhaps particularly if they've had difficulty in conceiving, maybe it's an in vitro fertilization uh, embryo, then we ought to think that we ought to protect that because of the interest of the parents, but, but not because of the interest of the embryo itself. It doesn't yet have interest. Francois Wall believes that there are many, many animals that would reach that level of uh, awareness, shall we say. Uh, so I guess then, let me ask you this. Do you think it is ethical 
for human beings to eat other animal forms? Uh, I certainly don't think it's ethical for us to raise animals as we do in conditions where we inflict suffering on them and then transport them in horrible conditions to slaughterhouses and kill them and eat them. Uh, no, I think that that's a totally unethical practice. Um, I put it that way because I don't want to sort of say, just as a blanket statement, it's always unethical to eat animals. I think if I were living in a country where uh, I had to... Uh, hunt some animals for food, let's say, or maybe a country where I had to herd cattle because I couldn't grow crops in the part of the world that I'm living and I have no other way of feeding my family than occasionally killing the, the cattle or sheep and, and eating them. That would be a different situation. So, so again, as we were talking about with capital punishment, I think the facts are relevant to the ethics. So you and I can walk into a supermarket and be presented with an array of foods that will nourish us, that we can afford, that are tasty, uh, and we can choose to buy meat or uh, we can choose to buy plant-based foods. And I think the ethical choice is to buy the, the plant-based foods and avoid the meat. Um, but as I say, for somebody else who just doesn't have those choices, uh, I'm not going to say that what they're doing is unethical. No, uh, it, it is a matter of what are the options we have, and, and given those options, it's not ethical for us to purchase the animal products. Gotcha. The Eskimo that can't garden, of course, has few options, and that's true of many places in the world. But um, veganism, then, uh, do you? I mean, do you believe that eggs from chickens and milk and dairy products uh, that should also that is also unethical, or is it just the farming method that's unethical? Well, um, you know, they're, they're, you have to take them separately. I, I think if, if somebody runs a few hens and uh, the hens are well looked after, they're, they've got plenty of room to run around and scratch and so on, they have a reasonable social life in their group, as hens do, uh, and they lay some eggs, they don't mind you taking the eggs. And uh, uh, so that I don't see a problem with, with eating eggs produced under those circumstances. Um, but, of course, most of the eggs sold in supermarkets come from factory farmed hens, uh, m m many of them still in cages, although there is now a move to get hens out of cages. And, and in California, as I was saying before, they can't be in those small cages anymore. Um, but still, they're still very crowded. They're in sheds maybe with thousands or tens of thousands of birds. Um, so that's far from ideal. Um, if you look at the dairy industry, uh, there is there are bigger problems about that. And, and the main problem with the dairy industry is that uh, cows are like uh, humans. Uh, the females do not produce milk uh, until after they've had a baby. Um, uh, but if you leave the calf with the cow, then the calf gets all the milk and the dairy farmer can't, doesn't have anything to sell. So the dairy industry depends on making cows pregnant every year and then separating the calf and the mother. And the bond between the mother and the calf is a very strong one. And anybody who knows the dairy farm will tell you that when that happens, the cows are calling and bellowing for their calves for a long time. So right. I don't think there are really ethical ways of producing dairy products on a, on a large scale anyway. Um, by the way, there's a new book on that that your readers or your listeners might like to pick up uh, by Neil Barnard called The Cheese Trap. Um, interesting both nutritionally and in terms of what happens to the cows. You know, I'm going to have to have you back the show. I've still got 20 questions sitting in front of me, and we haven't begun to tap onto them, and we're about out of time. If there's one message that you could leave with our audience, uh, what would that be, sir? Well, I mean, I suppose it would be to live ethically, and we've talked about a, a lot of that. Um, one thing that we haven't talked about is global poverty, uh, and if I can come back another time, I'd be happy to talk about that and the effective altruism movement. Uh, you can have a look at my website and People can get more about that. But uh, I do think we ought to be doing a lot more globally as well as domestically to help people in poverty. I love your work. Uh, I appreciate your uh, everything that you do, and I'm sure our listening audience will. And I'm going to have Ravinder bring you back, and we're going to talk about exactly that because uh, – I wanted to get there today, and that's uh, the substance of my remark about the two kidneys, and I think it's probably the most important 
message that you have in our time. However, my wife is a vegan, and uh, she did submit most of today's questions. So, all right, when we bring you back, we'll do that, Professor. I want to thank you for your work again and for your willingness to share it with us. Well, we've come to the end of another episode of Provocative Enlightenment. I want to thank all of you for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed our show and will join us again next week, same time and same place. And do tell your friends, and believe me, go get the book, Ethics in the Real World, 82 Brief Essays on Things That Really Matter, Professor Peter Skinner. Until next time, remember, wherever you are in the world, believing in yourself always matters. Provocative Enlightenment has been brought to you by Progressive Awareness Research and other sponsors. Provocative Enlightenment is a syndicated show and appears on other networks. For a schedule of showtimes, visit ProvocativeEnlightenment.com. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor, write to Eldon at EldonTaylor.com.